boss man at SOUTHCOM, Admiral Craig Fuller leads the U.S. Southern Command headquartered in Doral, we get a rare opportunity to sit down with the SOUTHCOM commander. People want a president that isn't just the loudest voice in the room. They already got that in the White House. Amy for America is here. The Minnesota senator stumps in South Florida. Can a moderate Midwestern policy maven win the Democratic nomination for president? Chewing gum, duct tape, and hope, a state grand jury says that describes school security plans almost two years after the Parkland shooting. We will take that to the round table. Good morning. So glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnam. I'm Glennon Milberg. We begin today with the man at the helm of the U.S. Southern Command, based in South Florida, on the front lines of our hemisphere's biggest issues. From that sprawling base in Doral, Southcom orchestrates U.S. military missions throughout Central and South America and the Caribbean. Soldiers, sailors, Marines, Air Force personnel, and Coast Guards men and women, and hundreds of civilians all take orders from Southcom. They respond to hot spots around the hemisphere, cooling them off when they are about to explode or putting out the fire when they do. We are talking about places like Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Haiti, among others. SOUTHCON responds to weather threats, drug trafficking, and acts of terrorism. Navy Admiral Craig Fowler just marked his first year since taking command of SOUTHCOM. He is a native of Freiburg, Pennsylvania. He served in the Middle East, Indo-Pacific, and Washington. He was senior military assistant to former Secretary of Defense James Mattis, who chose him to lead SOUTHCOM and, in fact, presided over the change of command last year. Welcome, Admiral Fowler. Great to have you with us. A year and a month. <laughs> <laughs> After you took the job. We're so glad you're here. Admiral, we want to get to the, the work of Southcom in just a minute, but let's talk about a story that has been all over the news, very disturbing, the shooting at Naval Air Station Pensacola, where this young Saudi, a 21-year-old, kills three sailors, wounds eight others, and you just have to wonder, how could this young man, who apparently hated America be a trainee at our military base. Well, it's, a, it, it's a horrible tragedy and at any time, particularly as we approach the holidays and our prayers are with the families and the victims, their friends. Right. I'd also like to note the heroism that we saw that day uh, is an example of the military team that I lead and, uh, and those people stood out as well as the first responders here in the state of Florida. Uh, anytime there's a tragedy like this, we'll, we learn from it. We do partnerships, what SOUTHCOM's mission is. We work with our partners in Latin America, and the training programs are so critical to that. And uh, when there's a, a breakdown and the wrong person uh, gets through, as it appears in this case, uh, we take the lessons from that, and we'll see what, uh, how that applies. So vetting is going to uh, change, be toughened, so that... You know, these hundreds, I guess thousands of young military recruits from other countries who come train in the United States with your military, our military, it's going to be harder for them or they'll be scrutinized at a higher level? We'll see what we can learn from this, Michael. The, the vetting process that we currently have in place is very rigorous and it focuses on getting the right person at the right time. It works. We'll see if there's a breakdown in that um, and anything we can learn or that this was an isolated case of an individual that, uh, that uh, had a different, uh, a different uh, view of the world. Uh, there are so huge successes with these uh, education military mm -hmm. training programs in our own region. For example, right now in El Salvador, new leadership, new government, and both the Minister of Defense and Chief of Defense are graduates of the International Military Education Training Program, Navy and Army War College, respectfully. So there's... There's many successes in, in how this builds our, our partners. The uh, Senator Rick Scott is, and among others, are calling for exactly what Michael was talking about, a more rigorous training. Um, and you, you can't help but remember that 9-11 of the 19 uh, terrorists in 9-11, 15 of them were Saudi nationals who took flight training here. And you would think since then so many things have been put in place, lessons learned, to your point. Do you agree with the senator that there, until we know those lessons learned, right now, right here, there should be a better vetting system for especially foreign national military members? We absolutely have to look at how we can Im improve the vetting system and learn everything we can from this. And uh, Senator mm -hmm. Scott is exactly on point with yeah. uh, 
the message and the, and the deep look that's going to occur. Yeah, Admiral Fuller, I want just to honor these three young men who were killed. Let's put their pictures up on the screen if we can. We want to see them, honor them. Joshua Watson was an ensign, 23 years old. Airman Mohammed Haytham, just 19. Airman Apprentice Cameron Walters, 21. And as you said, eight other young sailors were uh, wounded in this exchange, but you had men, young men, who rushed in and more people would have died if they had not. Absolutely. And so we, uh, we any, any loss of life is one too many though. So our hearts go out and we'll, we'll learn from this. My, in our area of responsibility, the, the United States Southern Command, uh, force protection, it's a term we use to mm -hmm. ensure that our service men and women are safe and can conduct their mission. The mission is safe is top priority. We focus on it every day. This lesson, uh, the lessons we learn from this, will apply uh, to everything we do, not only here in Doral for the protection of our own headquarters, but right. across the region. The headquarters in Doral is in the same city as uh, really what is one of two epicenters of Venezuelan expats, the other being Weston. And uh, it, Venezuela is kind of a focus now, I know, for South Common, especially the, uh, the drug and narcotics money that apparently has been amped up running through there and Nicolas Maduro's government. I saw an interview you did, Admiral, recently that talked about uh, what an issue that is because Southcom's drug interdiction efforts is very much a priority. Talk about that if you would. It's a travesty what's happened to the people of Venezuela and, and the just tremendous negative impact this is having across the hemisphere. We see it every day. And when Maduro's using food as a weapon and uh, lack of basic health services that's affecting the people uh, and it impacts the connection that we have right here in our neighborhood. This mm -hmm. is our neighborhood. Uh, mm -hmm. As you mentioned, Glenna, the, just the values that we're all, uh, so make us all so close. I, I, um, we, I'm confident that the right thing's gonna happen for the people, but it can't happen fast enough or soon enough Meanwhile, Maduro continues to line his pockets through narcotics and everything else. What is specifically Southcom's mission there? What do you, you wake up and the men and women go in and what, what are you doing there? Well, our mission is in support of the, the democratic process. So our government's been real clear on this. U.S. has been the largest donor of all sorts of aid, 650 million or so. Southcom's in support. We've been doing that through uh, missions like the, the deployment of the United States Naval Ship Comfort. Came back from our second deployment this mm -hmm. year. Uh, we treated over 68,000 uh, people that have been wow. impacted in the surrounding countries. Unfortunately, the place that Comfort needed to go the most to provide comfort, the name is so powerful, it's not able to go to because we can't make a port stop in a country that's not But run. it was, excuse me, it was off Colombia because Absolutely. there are what, a million or so Venezuelans maybe who are now have fled to Colombia and they need that medical help. I mean, these people are in desperate straits. Absolutely, we visited Colombia, other neighboring countries, countries that social services are being strained by the influx of, right. uh, it's a tribute to the, the neighbors, how well they're uh, handling it. It's, a, it's a, a crisis for them, but they're treating the people with dignity and respect. So in the, um, there, there is a decrease for the first time in a few decades in drug deaths in the U.S. Is the situation now with the, we'll call it narco-terrorism, that is supporting, at least in part, the Maduro government, is that a big challenge or is that something that is worrying you in the, in the course that it's taking or do you feel like Southcom is on course and handling that the, the only laws that Maduro cares about are what keeps him in power. So what that's done is created within Venezuela essentially a lawless area. The drug traffickers take advantage of that. Colombia is working really hard. They, they're getting after it. So they, they move from the pressure through Venezuela. It makes it so much harder to action uh, the drug trafficking organization. So it's a big concern of us. And those illicit profits are going to keep um, Maduro in power. He's taken from that. Yeah, Admiral, uh, I, I think we were all deeply concerned a few months ago when Maduro, when uh, Juan Guaido came as the opposition, and suddenly here comes this Russian military jet with, what, a hundred Russian troops landing uh, in Caracas or at a military base near Caracas. 
And you kind of say to yourself, I mean, this is dangerous for the hemisphere. It's dangerous for democracy. What, what does, when you see that, what does SouthCon do? Well, Russia is, is propping up the Maduro, and Cuba, right in there, propping right. up the Maduro regime. So they're the true invaders and the protectors. And so we uh, make a point to highlight every opportunity, uh, what Russia is up to, mm -hmm. not democracy in any shape, uh, form or shape, uh, and then and, and to, uh, to, with sanctions. So the U.S. government has responded with significant sanctions on the Maduro regime and on Russia. Right, so you are working hand in glove with the State Department. Clearly, there are areas of responsibility you've got, but then, you know, when it comes to trying to deal with Maduro, it's not only state, but it's CIA. I mean, there's a whole panoply of agencies that it's, are it's at work here. It's a true whole government effort. Uh, we're in support. As uh, intelligence, understanding what's going on drives everything. And so we work really closely with our partners in Brazil and Colombia. Uh, to find out as much as we can, and then we share that across the U.S. In interagency. And we will talk about Cuba, we will talk about Haiti. We're going to take a quick break, and we will be right back. Stay tuned. We are back with such a great opportunity to talk with Southcom Commander Craig Fowler. So great to have you here. Let's talk about uh, what's going on in Haiti right now. So important to South Florida and so many people with family there in total crisis. Banks closed, schools closed. The president, the subject of protest in the streets, and um, the Southcom and the men and women have such a, a humanitarian role there. Recently, there have been calls for the United States to stop meddling, I think was the word they used. What's your take, Admiral, Admiral on what, what the role is for SOUTHCOM, for the United States, how to quell and help the crisis at the moment? Having strong security forces is essential so that people can have hope. So we've been working with our embassy there to work the police force, the Coast Guard. We sent the United States Naval Ship Comfort because we think that helps, uh, gets the people what they need the most, which is hope that basic services can be uh, restored. And in fact, as the Miami Herald reported, um, when Comfort arrived, it brought a calm. So it was, it had a positive impact. Can, can I just get a little detailed here? So I, I believe we have video of the Comfort. When it is in port or offshore, how, what is the process? How do you find the people who need the most help and get them on board? How does that work? There's a screening process with some of the uh, non-government organizations and the, and the health officials ahead of time. Uh, it's a, a detailed uh, process to make sure the right people get the right treatment and that doesn't become a negative. Uh, you have a shore site and then a, a, a site on the ship mm -hmm. and uh, it was very successful. We've treated uh, thousands of people in the, in the week-long mission stop in Haiti. So this is part of SOUTHCOM's mission. Uh, this is the humanitarian side of the mission, but, you know, operating the, the, the comfort has got to be tremendously expensive. I'm sure it's a good investment, and I think it, uh, this is what this country should do, and I know you believe that too. So we have humanitarian missions, we have response to uh, uh, an imminent disaster, such as this week, we had a Chilean uh, C-130 right. down, we sent uh, United States uh, Poseidon P-8 uh, as immediate responder. Uh, the, the trust that we build is a long-term investment in the security of the hemisphere. Uh, it's a good investment. It secures the U.S., it secures our partners, and no two, no one nation can go it alone when it comes to security. Do you find everything about everything is so politicized these days? Do you find when you are working these partnerships with these foreign countries and ambassadors, what is their demeanor toward you? What is their um, take on the United States as a partner? When we work with our military partners, uh, this is a long-term relationship with, uh, starts with those professional values. Uh, it's, it's strong. They want to be a uh, partner with us. Uh, it transcends any political discussion of the day, and it truly is, uh, is uh, a reflection of the values we hold as U.S. military members. They want to be teammates with us. We're winners. And they want to be teammates with a winner. Yeah. Uh, Admiral Feller, I know over the years, quietly, and probably for very good reasons, the U.S. military, um, SOUTHCOM, among others, has spoken regularly or maybe, I don't know how often, every year to Cuba's military people 
about maritime matters policy. Um, I mean, there are some shared interests. Uh, how often do you all talk to Cuban military? Unfortunately, we don't have a mill-to-mill -mill relationship or a program right now with Cuba. It's just not a, a, a basis This is a thing uh, of the work. past? Yes, sir. So we, uh, we uh, hope for the best, but right now we are in a, a situation where we are in response to uh, what the policy here is in the United States. Uh, Cuba has a, a hand in a lot of nefarious uh, bad activity throughout the region. I wish it wasn't so, but uh, the pressure policy of the U.S. Yeah, is pretty well, they've clear. they a major hand in the problems of Venezuela. That's right. I mean, they have, you know, their secret police uh, of Cuba has trained the ones in Venezuela. I know that's a huge problem. That's right. They're, they are the uh, Cubans are basically, they consist mostly of what the presidential guard is that's now protecting the Maduro. That says a lot about how Maduro trusts his own people or uh, mm -hmm. could trust his own people if it takes Cubans to keep him in power. So there is not even a connection about a migration process or any kind of back channels that you probably wouldn't talk about anyway <laughs> to to mitigate what might be bilateral issues despite the politics. Well, I, we leave all the the uh, bilateral issues uh, to State Department and, and uh, our diplomats and how they work things that uh, we just watch it very closely at a mill to mill relation. It's, uh, it's a tough situation with uh, a country like that just, just miles away from South Florida, from the United States. Admiral Fowler, you are a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. 83, did you tell me? Yes, is sir. That, that is your class? Well, I'm old enough that I was there to cover a graduation ceremony in 1972. And in that era, the esteem for the military in this country after the Vietnam War was at a low point. Now it's at the highest I can remember. I think that, you know, you and the fellow men and women of our military services are, I think, the most trusted institution in this country. You've earned that trust. And the men and women with blood and toil have earned that trust. Uh, it's quite different now than it used to be. Well, yesterday was a great display of that Army Navy game. Uh, go Navy! Uh, I'm a joint commander. Do you have one of those hats? I do. So Greg I Scott wears all the time. I <laughs> do. I love that he wears that hat. Yeah, yeah. Navy. So uh, every day of the year we're one team, except for that one day, and uh, it was a great game. A great display of the professionalism, the service, the values. Yeah. Uh, it, it's America's game, and uh, the. The yeah. United States military is America's team. Yeah, as a matter of fact, after one play, I was watching, and normally players on one team don't help up players on the other. I saw, I think, a, a Navy player help up a Army runner after he had been tackled. I kind of thought, that's kind of cool. Well, they're going to they're gonna be fighting together. They're going to work together, and uh, those values transcend any competition on the playing field. But it was a good, it was a good day and a good yeah. game. You know, I know men like to talk about sports, but can I just go back to one more thing in the, sh the short time we have together? The, um, the migration at the border, I know Southcom has so much to do with, and, it, and I'm interested to hear you talk a little bit about strengthening the border and protecting the border, and at the same time balancing a humanitarian response to those trying to cross, because I, I get that Southcom is sort of right there on that front line. We're working very closely with our partners in Central America. The militaries are in those countries are in support of their own uh, police and border services, sharing information, intelligence, working on their professional development. That's a fundamentally a long-term way to get at this. I had the opportunity to sit down with uh, someone in a small village in Honduras that had walked all the way as part of one of these caravans mm -hmm. to the border and then come all the way back. And I said to this young man, I said, well, why'd you go? You knew it had to be unsafe. He said, well, my our family was starving and desperate, and I knew it was unsafe. I said, why'd you come back? He said, it's just so much more dangerous than I even thought. Wow. And so it just really fundamentally rips at the basic insecurity of individual people. And it's, a, it's really a reminder that what we're working here is, is security is one person at a time, trying to make a difference one yeah. person at a time. Yeah. Great point. Great point. Admiral Craig Feller, so good to talk with you and good luck with Southcom. Maybe we'll come out for the tour one day and you can uh, show us around what we normally can only see from the street. What, what's 
in there. We'd love to have you. We're without we're, your camera. <laughs> we're, we're good neighbors here in South sure. Florida. And Thanks so much. Okay. Thank, you. Have you. Thank you. Don't make it another year before you come back. <laughs> Up next, Thank we're you. taking all this week's hot topics to the round table. Stay tuned. It has been, needless to say, another tumultuous <laughs> week in the news. You know, when a president is Articles of impeachment were passed, and we want to take a closer look now at that and some other top stories with our roundtable. National, local, as always, we have a great roundtable, so some introductions first. Pam Keith is a labor lawyer and U.S. Navy veteran. Last year, she ran for Congress as a Democrat in the 18th Congressional District. Rosemary O'Hara is the editorial page editor of The Sun Sentinel. Mary Lee Cancio is an attorney in Miami and an influential voice in Republican Party politics on many levels. Ladies, welcome. <laughs> Powerful roundtable today. Yes, Great to yes, be it, here. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, Rosemary, let me begin by asking, I don't want all of you to weigh in on this, but uh, like all of you, I spent hours listening, watching to the uh, Judiciary Committee this week and these endless, interminable arguments one day for, what, 14 15 hours, and it, I came away, number one, depressed by what I had heard. I don't think it changed anybody's mind, certainly not on that committee, but what really bothered me was that it just underscored in the worst possible way the deep divisions, not only in Congress, but in this country, and how are we going to heal this stuff? I mean, what was your take from that? I, I wish I knew the answer to the healing part, but you're absolutely right about how divided we are. People on that committee knew how they were going to, I think, vote before of they, they even, and we've all made up our mind about the evidence. I think that they were appealing to the conscience, you know, the Republican, the Democrats were re appealing to the Republicans saying, what if this were a Democratic president right. who did this? Right. And the Republicans, you know, are saying, look, this isn't bad enough to get thrown out of office. And both are trying to appeal to the nation. But no, I, I share your yeah. it is forlornness. A, it is a, a political yeah, process. Good. You know, what, what was interesting, Pam, was that at the beginning, the very beginning at both chairs of both judiciary and intel committees had said at one point listen you know we want this to be a bipartisan buy-in before we do anything clearly it's not right. and clearly they did something yes. what happened there well i mean i think when you ask whether something is serious enough to be impeachable we have to remember that the republicans already put a poll in the ground when they impeached bill clinton and said hey just lying one time under oath was sufficient enough to be impeached and they've moved the goalpost now um, in this particular process glenna when we look at what is going on here we're not talking about some private personal peccadillo we weren't impeaching donald trump for paying off a porn star to keep quiet in the election which is on the level of what we're talking about about bill clinton here we're talking about the president using the office of the presidency and the resources of the people of the united states of america to try to get a leg up on a political opponent. And just to make it clear for folks, if it was the other way, if Joe Biden tried to cut a deal with Vladimir Putin and said, hey, hey, I think I'm going to win this. I'm, I'm ahead in all the polls. You give me all the dirt on Donald Trump and we'll lift those sanctions. Well, can we, I think well, Republicans would find that really problematic. I want to, yeah, you're making the arguments that have been made, but I, I really want to get back to that question. It's not clearly not a bipartisan process. So what happened, Mary Lee? To the country. It may be bipartisan the other way. I think there, there may be Democrats that may vote against uh, the impeachment the next week. And what we There'll saw. There'll be a few, sure. There, there might be some. That would be the bipartisanship, not uh, mm -hmm. having any Republicans yeah, that's, voting for that's, that. that. Excuse me. That's fear of losing a swing district. Whatever Which the is reason. legitimate. What, I whatever, mean. whatever the reason. But what we saw this week was that on Thursday night, they were debating until very late and they decided to hold it so that they could go back on TV on Friday. Like if they thought anybody really would be watching or caring to see their continued uh, circus that was happening on TV. I don't think the American public well, really... I think the Democrats have a different take on oh, why they went so Of course the so Democrats have a, have, a, have a different take, but I just find that, that minds are not being changed. The American yeah. public is tired. I mean, I think they're happy with uh, passing, you know, the U.S. Uh, MCA agreement or different things that may be yeah. happening in Congress, but not impeachment, because now it's going to move to con uh, to the Senate, and 
it's not going to go anywhere. They're not going to have 67 senators vote for impeachment. So this needs to get over quickly. We've seen but how the timeline... But at the, the same time, it was important that these articles be, be brought and for somebody to say, this kind of conduct is not okay. It's not okay you know, for a Republican. It's not okay for a Democrat okay, uh, to invite Mary, a foreign nation the, to be involved the, in our election, to use the power of his what office is not a, no, to what, say, you're well, not, that you is cannot. Your, that is your opinion. No, but I it's, think what, the, it's no. what our diplomats what, said. What about the IG report? What about the IG report this week that found 17 major mistakes with the FISA warrant process. Even today, Sunday, Comey said, oh yes, I made a mistake. I'm sorry, two years later is a little too did late Did you listen you. to the diplomats who testified? Uh, oh yes, I did listen to and the diplomats. And did you believe them? You know, why are, why is our intelligence um, arms and our diplomat, our State Department people, why do Republicans have such a hard time believing so many people who are telling us what they're, they, they've worked for, I, Republican I, presidents, I, Democratic I, presidents? Why don't you, you know, believe Rosemary? them? I, I do believe them, and that is not, I, I also believe the IG report, and I also believe that for the first time we had spies in, in, in a presidential campaign of Donald Trump, and that is something that we don't talk I, about I, enough. I don't think that that's what the IG report said, and in fact, it stated its conclusion was that the acts of the FBI were pro appropriate and based on reasonable facts. This whole investigation happened because of what we got from the Australians, not from the Steele report. That was not where it began, and the bottom line is this. If Donald Trump's campaign walked into an investigation of Russian activity, then they get caught up in that trap. The way that Donald Trump could have avoided that is to have reported the approaches from the Russians to the FBI like he was supposed to, like every patriot should have. Right, we're a little bit in the weeds. Let's get back if we can and just the brief time remaining in this segment, you know, to where it goes now because it's going to go to the Senate. Wednesday the House is going to vote and they will vote along party lines and pass these two articles of impeachment. And Mara Lee, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, we know what the Senate's going to do. Mitch McConnell already, you know, has taken sides. He's supposed to be impartial, but he has said, I'm going to follow orders from the White House. I mean, that just sets the tone for what we are going to see, which is more partisan politics. Politics are partisan, and hopefully we can move forward and get some things done. Because Well, Congress, as you said earlier, is getting things done with, you know, a budget resolution, mm -hmm. And with the uh, United States, Canada, Mexico trade agreement, it's kind of amazing. But it's amazing that they waited for a whole year, and coincidentally, the day that they issue, uh, you know, that the impeachment, well, they got it they, done. They, immediately within an hour, they yeah. they announced yeah. that, and there's a reason for that. They were just holding that in their back pocket. They should have done it way sooner. All right, it's going to be a, a big week, a lot to watch, and we have a lot more to talk about. So stay <laughs> tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs> We are back with our great roundtable, Pam Keith, Rosemary O'Hara, Mary Lee Cancio, uh, talking about, let's talk about the election a little bit. Uh, Minnesota Senator and candidate for President Amy Klobuchar was in town today, her fourth visit to Florida. Very small group of uh, union people. There she is walking into the SEIU headquarters in Miami the other day. On Friday. Right. On Friday, uh-huh. And, um, and, you know, we, we had an opportunity to talk to her this woman is bright. She is deep in the weeds on details, on policies. She knows it. She, I watched her kind of temper herself and not get in the weeds. What, Rosemary, this is a woman who obviously is capable of being president, politics aside. Mm -hmm. Does she, in her sort of moderate lane, policy wonky woman, have a shot at the Democratic nomination? You know, we've all been so focused talking about this impeachment that we're not talking about the really, which we know how it's going to go, that the one thing that we need to keep our eye on that we don't know is what happens in March in the presidential primaries and mm -hmm. who the Democrats pick. And what a lot of us who are paying close attention think is that a moderate, not a socialist, is the best choice for America for to run against Donald Trump. And in that lane, Amy Klobuchar, Biden, Bloomberg, Buttigieg, 
The problem is that those of us who pay attention know that she is in that lane, but the great many people mm -hmm. are not paying attention, and she hasn't been able to break out to get the kind of name recognition she needs. And she may and not. And deserves, be, and deserves. Yeah, excuse me, and she may not, or none of the Democrats may break out on Thursday night as they are supposed to in their next debate mm -hmm. because there is a union right. negotiation in L.A. at Loyola Mount, Marymount and nobody, no Democrat is going to cross a picket line. No. So they, that debate uh, may be off. You know, one of, one of the things that we had talked about on Friday is because a couple of weeks ago we were also at the BB&T Center mm -hmm. when the president was here with 22,000 people and I asked Senator Klobuchar you know, one-on-one -on -one, people meet her, they understand what she's about and, and really kind of get behind her. I said, can you imagine walking up to the stage in the BB&T and having 20,000 people? And, and is that a fair question? She said, yeah, absolutely, we do big events. But, you know, the point is, despite policy and intellect, the, the average voter wants to be excited mm -hmm. and passionate and engaged. And you see the president has that. Do you see Democrats getting there? I don't see it happening, um, and I'm saying this really objectively. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, it's, not like, it's not like Obama. No, no, seriously. You know, Obama brought that excitement. Mm -hmm. He did. And, and we don't see any mm -hmm. candidate. I mean, perhaps Bernie Sanders, you see much bigger crowds uh, with Senator Sanders go out and, and speaks, but you don't see that uh, with with Biden or Buttigieg or, you know, I just don't see it. So that, that lack of excitement, and I agree completely with what Rosemary said, that the impeachment has taken its oxygen away from the yeah. Democratic race. So we're not talking about who's going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party. Most Democrats don't know who could beat Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, it's, wanna... kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of ancillary, but Pam, let me ask you to mm -hmm. weigh in. I mean, nobody here, we don't know. I think uh, the politics of the UK very well, but in Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson mm -hmm. and the Tories' big win this week, I think there is a message to the Democrats, is there not, That's about true. you better pick a more moderate candidate or else, you know, you're right. going to go down in flames. Well, I think that that is the sort of superficial message. The problem that, and why it doesn't translate directly is that labor was also pro-Brexit. If right. what was going on in the UK was Brexit versus not Brexit, labor played it badly by also being pro-Brexit. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy Corbyn was toxic in the UK for a variety of reasons, right. not the least of which was a very strong strain of anti-Semitism, yes. which doesn't play well anywhere. So I don't know that it translates exactly to our politics, but I do think there's a lesson there. I obviously am a progressive, and I, I've made no, no noise about that, but, but the reality is who can beat Trump is a, it, there are legitimate arguments in two different lanes. The first argument being you got to run somebody who appeals to the middle and gets those swing and, and maybe uh, Republican-leaning voters, and the second vote attitude is no. Uh, when we try to do that, uh, and we don't excite our base, we don't turn out the people that we need to, and we are only going to win with surges in the African American, Latino, and, and young vote, and that we have to pick a candidate that, that appeals to that vote. Honestly, I think there are different ways of squaring this particular circle. And given that Donald Trump is polling under 40 percent in many of these swing states, um, I don't think we should be deciding what we do as Democrats on what pleases Republicans, because God knows that is not how they choose their candidate. You know, Rosemary, I want to get your take on something that we spotted this week. The West Side Gazette is a very well-read <sighs> newspaper in Fort Lauderdale's African-American community. And this week, <laughs> the president's, uh, President and Trump's campaign put an ad in it, huh. which a lot of people found um, interesting. Uh -huh. what, do you what do you think? Uh, I didn't know that. Um, I guess I remember the president saying to the African-American community, what have you got to lose? I mean, I guess it's up to the African-American community to s ask themselves, do they feel like they're better off? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the statistics and the numbers do show that they are better off. And we were seeing how the African-American support of the president has increased. He received 
a much higher number uh, than Romney, and he will receive a higher percentage during his re-election campaign. Right. It is really interesting I to see a, a glimpse into the strategy yeah. of the Trump Brad campaign. Brad yeah. is yeah. a brilliant yeah. Sure yeah. I strategy, highly but, doubt that. But I Joe Biden has got... That. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not seeing those numbers. South Carolina, <laughs> South Carolina <laughs> Joe Biden is going to just get... His, his numbers are going to be better than during his election campaign, the yeah. percentage that he received. That is, that is the number. I'm not saying that he's going to win the African-American vote. I am saying his numbers are going to do better. Shall we, shall we take a little break? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, stay tuned. We'll be back. Welcome back. We are in the midst of a really great roundtable, and now we kind of want to turn our attention to sea level rise and climate change. And, Rosemary, you were in Key West last week for the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact. You and the editorial pages of the Palm Beach Post the Miami Herald are doing this series of really outstanding editorials, but the takeaway, the simple takeaway for me, was that, you know, the scientists who were there said that rather than 14 to 26 inches of sea level rise by 2060, it's going to be 17 to 31 inches yeah. by that time. And so that's just the mid-range. You know, we though everybody agrees the sea is rising, even those who don't believe it's that climate change is affecting it but um the but it is but there is an ex for those who are studying this it's accelerating and the pace at which it's accelerating is 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 curving up right. and we're seeing things now that we've never seen before we've seen streets that are flooded for three months on mm -hmm. end in yeah. key, largo. key largo we're seeing insurance rates that are about to put commercial property underwater in the Keys. We're hearing that to raise a three mile stretch of road, it's gonna cost $180 million That's, I saw in the that Keys. this week and I thought, what, can I just show you what three feet is like? This is three feet, it's not a lot. We, we talk about sea level rise so often, it's in the news, it's a concept. Mm -hmm. That conference made really specific uh, policy Mm -hmm. details and attention and one, one of the things I really you are in the keys a lot I know th this idea of managed retreat I mean there will be properties in the keys and elsewhere along the coast that will not exist yes. in a few decades uh, merely and, and houses that should not be rebuilt we see hurricanes talk about mm -hmm. that you know, and we, the, the emotional impact of thinking about your home maybe Atlantis at one point <laughs> you know, it, it, it's really a reality yeah. and when people start realizing that maybe they're not going to be able to get their boats under a bridge because uh, the sea level ha has mm -hmm. risen and that sailboat or mm -hmm. that boat is not going to, you know, people are going to feel affected when they start selling real estate. And you, when you start seeing you live in Miami Beach and you start selling your house and people say, well, I can't afford to buy your house because the flood insurance is ridiculous. And so it's going to have an effect in our economy. And once people feel it in their pocketbooks, that's when you're going to see real change taking place. And we're seeing that conversation about climate change, environment. I think it's going to dominate yeah. the mayoral race in Miami, the environmental it's issues. It's going to dominate yeah. a lot of races. Mm -hmm. And Pam Keith, you know, I mean, give Ryan DeSantis at least this. Mm -hmm. Rick Scott didn't even want right. to use the term right. sea level rise or climate change. And Governor DeSantis has appointed a very competent woman to be the chief resilience officer, I don't know, is that her title? Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. And I will give Governor DeSantis credit that he is taking uh, some of these water management and uh, sort of environmental issues more seriously than his predecessor did. I think we just have to accept that there is no localized answer because it's a global problem and it has to be addressed on a global level. Uh, we're not going to be able, you know, there are things that we can do maybe locally in terms of uh, urban design or yeah. uh, resilience resilience, pumping, and things like that. There are things that you can do in the short term. But the reality is, um, if this is a money fight, and most political fights are actually money fights, there are people making decisions right now that uh, polluting and carbon uh, emissions, uh, the people making money doing that right now are more important than the people risking their real estate investments down the road. I think, as, as Mari Lee so uh, eloquently pointed out, that political dynamic could very soon shift. The Speaker of the Florida House is from Miami, of yes. all places. Mm -hmm. And this is, we're about to go into the legislative session. 
and um, Speaker Oliva won't won't talk about sea level rise. So, so most of South Florida gets it. The business community, the local government, yeah. the business community is really involved in this. The governor has put his toe in the water, but let us see an agenda. Let us get something big done this session. So far, I haven't seen yeah. him propose anything. Yeah, well, the legislature meets in January. So, Speaker Oliva, if you're watching, Stick your toe in the water and do something about it. <laughs> Come in. Thank you so much. Great Thank round you. table. Great to have you all. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you. Up next, a Florida grand jury rips into school districts for failing student security and suggests unprecedented consequences. Stay tuned. Take a look right there at your screen. A live look now from tower cams across South Florida. Oh, okay. what a beautiful day. And here is weather authority <laughs> meteorologist Brandon Orr with the Sunday forecast. Brandon. Hey guys, yeah, it's nice out today. It's beautiful, ton of sunshine, and it's cooler than yesterday. 87 degrees was our high yesterday. Normally we're into the upper 70s. That tied the record high temperature. So 80 degrees. I know we had a cold front move through, but it wasn't very strong. But still, 80 degrees is not bad. It's a couple degrees above average and zero percent chance of rain today. Now that that cold front has passed, second cold front comes in, and this comes in around Wednesday or so with a few showers. And we're watching a third one that arrives just in time for the week. Weekend. So rain chances all over the place. Best days though will be on Thursday, Friday, 20% chance of rain and we're back down to the middle 70s for highs. Brandon, thanks so much. School safety and security in South Florida was redefined in Parkland on February 14th, 2018. In the weeks, months and now almost two years since, students, parents and communities demanded change and lawmakers responded with laser focus and stunning speed. And that's why the Florida Grand Jury Report published this week shocks the senses. In the 18 pages, jurors document how school districts have lagged or flat out failed to put into practice mandatory security fixes. Of Florida's 67 counties, only two school districts are name checked in that report, Miami-Dade and Broward counties. Some of those headlines, emergency radio systems identified early on as deficient, still aren't fixed. Jurors cite power struggles and turf wars. They say the new mandate for armed security in schools has become political and met with minimal compliance in some cases. Dangerous behaviors in schools still go unreported because teachers and students fear reprisals from administration. And jurors accuse those administrators of cooking the books, manipulating data to hide the numbers of dangerous incidents. That actually prompted an email from Miami-Dade school's attorney telling the statewide prosecutor the grand jury is mistaken. The grand jury writes that there is more to come from them, but they also were so concerned with their findings they wanted lawmakers to see them before a session begins next month. Within those 18 pages are suggestions for solutions, but an unsettling prediction that districts will not comply with security measures unless there are consequences from withholding funding to indicting administrators on criminal charges. That would be a first, as there have been so many firsts since that afternoon at Douglas High. Attention to keeping students safe that were a long time coming. If you want to read that grand jury report, you can firsthand. It's right there on our website on local10.com. And while you're there, you can catch any of our programs on local10.com. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Hope you have a great Sunday. Please do subscribe to our This Week in South Florida podcast while you're there. Wish Michael Putney a happy birthday tomorrow. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Thank you, Michael.